Good morning, everyone. Welcome. Welcome to the Unitarian Church of Edmonton. My name is Jeff Pizans. My pronouns are he, his, him, and among others. And I'm your service leader this morning. I'll be joined by our minister, Reverend Rosemary Morrison. We hope that you, you in the sanctuary, you online, you are new visitors, um, uh, you who are watching at some future date on, on YouTube, we hope that you all feel very welcome here today. The Unitarian Church of Edmonton is a liberal, religious, multi-generational community. We are a collection of free-thinking, spiritually questing individuals joined in common support and action. Whatever your heritage, whatever your faith, whomever you love, however you identify, you are welcome here. I should note, for those who are new here, that this church is one of two Unitarian Universalist churches in Edmonton, the other being the Westwood Unitarian Congregation in the Park Allen neighborhood. We gather with gratitude this morning on Treaty 6 land. We recognize that a treaty is an inheritance, a responsibility, and a relationship. May this recognition help us to be good neighbors to one another, good stewards to our planet, and good ancestors to all our children. We are grateful as well to all the volunteers who make this service possible. The list includes the greeters and ushers here in the sanctuary, all the people who work to deliver the service online, and those who created the service with words, images, and music. As we begin this special time together, I encourage you to ask your devices not to do what they do best, and that is disrupt, at least long enough so that we can enjoy the service together. And to make sure that service gets off to an exciting start, we start with some announcements. Let's start with Rosemary. <clears throat> Good morning. Good morning. Once more. Good morning. Good morning. Okay, now you're awake. We'll wake you up. Uh, my name is Rosemary Morrison. I'm the minister here. It's my pleasure to serve this congregation. My pronouns are she, her, and hers. And welcome to everyone here in the sanctuary and to those online. Um, my announcement is that this coming Friday here on this very, on Sundays it's a chancel, but on Friday it's going to be turned into a stage. And the stage will feature you singing karaoke. <laughs> and, the, and the stage will feature you singing karaoke. And we'll all clap for you. And we need participants, and we need audience, and I am going to need some help setting up and in the kitchen, in the Keeler Hall, and in the sanctuary. So if you can help me on Friday with cooking in the kitchen, setting up in here or in Keeler Hall, and most importantly, clean up. Please let me know. Thank you. And another announcement from Susan. Yes, I'm Susan Rattan, speaking on behalf of the board, just to remind you that we have an emergency meeting of the congregation right after this service. Um, there'll be kind of five minutes for people to hit the washroom and we have to set up a few mics here. And uh, yeah, and it will be online as well. Uh, so really important meeting, won't be very long, I don't think. And Audrey. I just wanted to let people know that there is a huge rally today starting at 2 o'clock at the McDougall Church with a 300 uh, voice choir starting and also some of the other uh, professional choirs are going to be there too. Then a walk to Churchill Square singing all the way and then a huge rally there. So if anyone wants to enjoy this beautiful sunny day and support the trans people and the strange things that are happening in Danielle Smith's mind, then please join us. Thank you. Thank you, Audrey. 
And before we go on, we're going to have a time of contemplation of music with a prelude. Karen's going to play a piece called Just a Feeling. Thank you, Karen. I invite Yolene to light the chalice for us this morning. Yolene is a longtime member with a great smile in this congregation. Consider these words written by Amanda Gorman and adapted by Lee Morris. There is always a light when we are ready to see it. There is always a light when we are ready to be it. To see the light, to be the light, to raise our eyes in the dark of night, to climb this hill, together we will. Shine your light in the darkness, let your, light, let your bright light burn out loud and be a gift to the world. Thank you, Lynn. Our opening hymn is number 118, This Little Light of Mine. The words will appear on the screen behind me and on the computer screens for those of you online. Please stand as you're willing and able to join in singing hymn 118. The theme of this service is freedom, a personal act. Much has been said about the concept of freedom. In a simple form, it's used in everything from marketing to political sloganeering. In its more prov provocative forms, it causes us to think about what the word means, what its limits might be, and how we might want to use the idea to structure the way we interact with each other in society, in our, in our communities. Freedom, a personal act. It's interesting to think of freedom not as a state of being or as an aspirational state, but as an act. Reverend Rosemary will have more to say about this idea later. As a personal act, I have decided not to say anything more about freedom. <laughs> Instead, I'm turning the pulpit over to Oksana Atwood, who has an excellent idea for us to pursue. <clears throat> so um, it was, I think, just uh, last week that Jeff had a reading that really spoke to me, and it was by Nathan C. Walker, and it said, we as seekers of freedom are required to make justice, not simply a product, but a process, and as it says in the title of our today's service, freedom is an act, short for action. 
Um, and Walker continue, continues, just actions are the means by which to achieve a justice society. But he goes on to talk about the act of the craft of justice making. So he's implying that it's not just emotion, but an action, something tangible like a craft that we can cut and paste and glue back together and play with, throw out ideas. And that's what we're doing this month. We're making maps and looking at how we use our building and looking at how we use our space, and then in turn, how our community sees us. So during our activity at the end of January, um, when we were talking about love, we engaged in a meaningful activity and compiled a list of things we cherish in our church. And some of those things um, are our banners, symbols of different religions when we come in the front door, the ceiling shapes here. People talked about the halls, the circular nature of our, of our building, the kitchen, the labyrinth, the height and the width of the spaces that we have. They talked about the quiet room, you talked about the chairs, the workroom, the candles that we get to light. All of these are elements of the things that we love within this building. Um, and as we're moving forward into our next activity, we want to remember that when we're playing with maps or tangible elements, we, they not only show us where we're headed, but where we come from. They, these symbols and these artifacts that we love in our church really reveal the rich history and the roots of where we've come from as a church. So there's roots, R-O-O-T-S, but there's also roots, R-O-U-T-E-S. And today I'm asking you to draw a little bit about the roots that you take to church. So in our church community, we have to be aware of how congregants and visitors get to our services and how do, we, how do they navigate. So we have a few different activities today. The first one is on the board at the back, which you're welcome to do when you like. There's a small square that says church. And if you're able to kind of think of how you actually get to church, you know, you might make a right turn, a left turn, go over the bridge, end up getting your way to church. See if you can draw that route over there. That's one of the options um, to do throughout the service or after the service. <clears throat> um, but what I'd like to do is engage in a discussion, and I'm going to uh, kind of divide us up into the modalities that we come to church. So uh, just a quick survey. Uh, I'm wondering how many people drove by themselves to church today? Could you raise your hands? Okay. And could I ask how many people drove with one or two or more other people today coming to church? Okay. And, uh, and could I just ask, did anybody brave the elements and walk or cycle or take the bus today? Right on, that's awesome. <laughs> and I also uh, want to make sure that we realize that there's a huge component coming to church that we don't see. So we have our online, uh, our online participants, our online cong congregants, and they also made their way to church in their own way today. So we're going to just divide up into our groups um, just very briefly to have a discussion around one question. And so the question is for those online and for those who will be in your groups. And it is, what are the challenges you face getting to church? So if you don't mind having an online discussion and perhaps sharing some of those ideas on the chat room. But for now, I'm going to ask those who drove by themselves to come to this side of the room in the front here. And I will ask uh, Jeff if he can give you a pen and um, paper here. And I'd like you to write down what are some of the obstacles you have in coming to church. So for those who drove by themselves, please come to the front here. And uh, for those of you who drove with one other person or more, if you wouldn't mind kind of gathering over here in this area, right around Karen Mills. Uh, so for those who drove in multiple, uh, in, in, with more than one person, uh, please gather around Karen Mills here. And Karen, I have a sheet of paper here if you don't mind jotting down notes about the obstacles. Thank you. Now, for those who walked, I know there's just two of you. Do you mind sitting together? And we'd love to hear about your perspective as well. So in groups, we'll have about five minutes to discuss and jot down the obstacles in getting to church. And if you don't want to participate in one of those groups, please try out our map in the back. As I mentioned before, if those who are online could talk about the obstacles that they have, perhaps getting to the church physically, but also 
If you are online, we understand that there might be other obstacles in attending church, for example, Wi-Fi connectivity, physical issues, or other issues. Walking, you have to be healthy enough on any given day to do the walk, and if you have a bad back, it's a problem, and sometimes the sidewalks are icy. If you're getting dropped off, you have to have someone who is able and willing to drop you off, and then you have to beg for a ride home, which you'll probably get. Good morning, my name's Karen Mills. My pronouns are she, her. Um, so I was uh, scribing for the group that had more than one person in a vehicle coming this morning and some obstacles that we cited were construction and route changes because of construction. Um, actually getting out of bed, particularly if you have a warm, cuddly animal in with you. Um, agreeing on what time to leave, that seemed to be causing some discussion. Uh, having a long or tricky route if you were picking up someone else, and um, not having a directory to look up a, another source of rides if your usual source wasn't available. So there were several variations in this group about getting out, of the, door, getting out the door on time. There were several variations on weather, minus 40 and so on. Um, and this was the group that came here alone, and um, there, one person mentioned, and many agreed, going alone's not the best way. It's better to go with somebody. So those were three more. Take you over. And I'm not sure if we have any feedback from those online, but I will be excited to look at that afterwards. And if you happen to be seeing this video in the future on YouTube, please post below any comments about any difficulties you might have in getting to church. Um, we just want to, with an activity like this, we want to identify that there's a number of voices we're not hearing from, uh, and we want to ask why. So there are people coming to our church who have co-parenting schedules, work shifts, people who go to different churches, people who slept in, people who might not care for the theme, people who are sick, grieving, or struggling with mental or physical wellness, and we really need to consider the challenges faced by different members and the accessibility of our church. Um, our church is a support for people during difficult and uh, celebratory times for those who are physically in the building and also online. But without a building, none of these things would be possible. So after church today, please stay for a presentation about our roof and what we need to do to support this building so that it can in turn support us. Thank you. Thank you, Alexander. Um, Let's share our abundance. Uh, if the ushers could um, begin collecting, that would be useful, helpful. Our church community is entirely self-governing and self-supporting. One of the responsibilities of our free church tradition is that we provide all the financial support for the work of the church and the roof. <laughs> In addition, we also make a monthly contribution beyond our walls. One half of the unidentified cash that is received is given to an organ outside organization. <clears throat> For the month of February, we are sharing our abundance with I the iHuman Youth Society. Since 1997, the iHuman Youth Society has engaged as Edmonton's marginalized youth to foster positive social and personal development, well-being, and social change. It all began, many of you might remember, with that five-ton gun sculpture. It was a rather stunning piece of work. The initial idea following that was to create a space for, to nurture, for nurturing the creativity of street youth. Now iHuman has a wide range of programs, including outreach, art studios, mental health clinic, 
family activities, and even classes in cooking. Some of us took a tour of iHuman a few years ago. What was really striking was sort of hanging in the air, energy, creativity, and a really strong sense of commitment. <clears throat> At iHuman, people, people do the hard work of taking care of each other. The organization certainly deserves our support. For those of you here in the sanctuary, if you wish to receive a tax receipt for your gift, you can use the envelopes on the table at the back of the sanctuary. Many of our members and friends give monthly or annually through automatic withdrawal from their accounts. For those of you online, you can visit the iHuman website to donate. So we thank you for your generosity and your support. With our time, our talents, and our money, we support the work of the community of this Unitarian Universalist tradition. So let's join in singing. Thank you. Our next hymn is number 1059 in the Teal Book. May your life be as a song. For those online, the text will appear on your screen. Please rise and sp in spirit as we sing together hymn 1059. Thank you so much, Jeff and Oksana, for all of that wonderful stuff already. Freedom, a personal act. And I have a reading first by Sikh activist Valerie Kaur. Love is a wellspring from which we can all drink, but we may be coming to the wellspring from different paths. I think all of us come from different paths, don't we? You can come to it from different sources of inspiration, but the love ethic itself it is what is available for all of us, no matter who we are. I described love as sweet labor, a fierce and bloody and imperfect life-giving choice that we make. And if love is labor, then love can be taught. Love can be modeled. Love can be practiced. What I find so invigorating is that more and more of us now are naming the practices, how to be brave with your grief, how to honor your rage, how to let go of things that are dragging you down, and the little critic in your mind that's keeping you from realizing your full self the more we can share the good news around these practices, the more we can say, all of us can have access to building beloved community right where we are. And a short bit from one of my favorite books about community um, is written by Peter Block, Community, the Structure of Belonging. The social fabric of community is formed from an expanding shared sense 
of belonging. It is shaped by the idea that only when we are connected and care for the well-being of the whole that a civic and democratic society is created. It's like that bodhisattva belief that not one of us can enter nirvana until all of us, all, have gone before. What makes community so complex is that it occurs in an infinite number of small steps, sometimes in quiet moments that we notice out of the corner of our eye. It calls for us to treat as important many things that we thought were incidental. And afterthought becomes the point. A comment made in passing defines who we are more than all that came before. The key to transforming community, then, is to see the power in the small but important elements of being with others. The shift we seek needs to be embodied in each invitation we make. Each relationship we encounter and each meeting we attend. For at the most operational and practical level, level, after all the thinking about policy, strategy, mission, and milestones, it gets down to this. How are we going to be when we are together? It's the end of the quote. First of all, I'd like to say, go Chiefs. And welcome the year of the dragon. So those two important things are happening right now, or today, yesterday. And the description I'd like to remind us of this message goes something like this. Media and corporations try to make us believe we need more things to be happy with ourselves. Let's push back on that notion. Rather than asking ourselves what we need to be happy, Let's ask ourselves what we can give. Radical acts of justice making include being content with ourselves, sharing what we have, offering our services as we can. Just imagine the world if we all took these small steps, these incidental little things. The reading by Peter Block in his book, Community, the Structure of Belonging, would have us take this concept a, a little bit further. What if these acts of justice extended beyond ourselves? And if we were not just content with ourselves, but we were excited and content about being part of and contributing to this community and maybe other communities that you're a part of as well, Small acts of justice, the freedom to be who we are, personally and collectively. That is who we are as Unitarian Universalists. That's how we evolved. We pushed back against being told what to do since the 1500s. And we pushed back against how to live and, more importantly, how, what to believe. Historically, Unitarian Universalists have gotten into a lot of trouble for not believing in the Trinity. Insisting, we insist that God is not three in one Trinity, but just one, unity, unity or Unitarian. Then we got into more trouble when the Universalists started in on their talk about being already saved. Imagine, you had, we, all the Universalists were saying, it, mostly in the United States, you already are going to heaven. There is no need to be saved. And Universalists got into a lot of trouble for saying that because these were heretical thoughts, and it caused us to be persecuted, chased out of town, and off the European continent. The Unitarians that arrived in North America were trying to find some peace some place where they could practice their faith without persecution, where they could be content. This is where we've come from, and we've come a long way. 
Universalism sprung up in North America and also went against the masses, as I said, and told about how we were supposed to be and what to believe, and against what the masses were being told in order to be controlled. Pushing against the status quo is something we have always, always done and are still doing. We have taken it to a no, new level, though, haven't we? Instead of telling anyone what to believe, we say to one another, I'm here to support you on your journey to find your light, to find your being, to find exactly who you are. I'm here to help you. I'm going to walk with you on this journey through your life. And here you can explore different religions, different ways of being in the world, all while finding out what makes you tick and what, make, what works for you. In this day and age, that's a concept I can buy into. What are you pushing against in society? Perhaps it is becoming more of who you really are by exploring, which I am doing right now, aging gracefully, becoming more creative, exploring gender and other binary concepts to see if they fit for you, or because you need to understand the complete human experience in a more robust way. I don't know of a more accepting and loving community to do all this exploring in. You do not have to be alone as you navigate your life, your spirituality, your beliefs, and your desires. This concept, this freedom, is built into our principles, a responsible search for truth and meaning. Ours is not a comfortable religion. It is not an easy way to be. I sometimes think it'd be so much simpler if somebody would just tell me what to think or what to believe. If we didn't have to do all this work to try to figure it out on our own, but then, of course, none of us would be here, would we, if anybody was trying to tell us what to think or what to believe or how to be. That's why we're here, to let our light shine. But we aren't on our own, are we? We get to build community right here, right now, a place where we can turn to one another, explore ideas, grow spiritually and personally, and find the courage to do the right thing even when the right thing is really hard. When I was in seminary, I read a few of Pope Francis's sermons, and one part of the sermon has always stuck out for me, one part of one of his sermons. <laughs> it's the only part that I've ever remembered about any of his sermons. Anyway, in this sermon, he talks about how, congreg how congregational life mirrors and mimics family life. We get annoyed with one another, just like a family. We, a few take up the slack that others create. Sometimes we don't know each other at all and wonder well, how in the world we all got to the same place at the same time. Sometimes we fight. Sometimes we come together and have fun. Pope Francis likens this experience, this Sunday morning experience, to kind of the main meal of the day when the family comes together and is nurtured, becomes reacquainted, shares the day with one another, accomplishments are acknowledged and praised, shortcomings are discussed, and plans are made for the upcoming days or weeks. So in his mind, it's kind of like the day of a family is like our week. So we go out during the day or through the week, and then every Sunday we come together, just like a family comes together for that main daily meal. This Sunday morning service is where we, a type of family, come together to see one another, to visit with those we know, and to welcome newcomers to the table. We celebrate our accomplishments sometimes, and we share griefs and sorrows and joys. 
So this morning, let's just take a moment to reflect on all that has gone on in our home over the last little while, our building. It's been quite the few weeks, folks. A lot has happened, in case you hadn't noticed. Those of you had, that have helped out mitigating the damage of the leaky roof and the frozen furnace, I want to tell you and acknowledge how grateful I am to you. Those who came out last Saturday to help Andrew Mills, thank you. And I guess sometimes at the family table, we all kind of notice that maybe one of our members of the family has done a little bit more than the rest of us. And so I didn't ask Andrew uh, beforehand, which I meant to do, but I'd kind of like us to, uh, if, if you see Andrew, to give him uh, a high five or a thank you or something. And so I'd like to publicly thank him for all the work that he has done. You okay with this, Andrew? He's waving at me. Oh. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, yeah, no hugging, Andrew. He's sick. Okay. But he has put a lot of effort into thinking about how to navigate the leaky roof, the frozen furnace, the burst sprinkler pipes, and on and on, and he just happened to pop in here one evening on his way to casino to drop something off, heard water running, and saved the day. So I've written, I'd like you to thank him in a myriad of ways, and more importantly, support him, and, and, but don't hug him. Yeah. We are faced with a big challenge, and I know that working together as a loving and covenantal community and using all your creativity, you will find a way forward. My job in all of this is to love you and care for you and support you, not tell you what to do. These big decisions are yours to make. And I will be present for the congregational meeting, and I will be holding you all in deep care and with big love. You may or may not have noticed that there's a sub-theme of light running through this service. When we think about living our lives as a freedom act, a radical act, it is the acceptance of our own light that we must grapple with. You know, and as I was writing that, then of course that Marianne Williamson quote that um, Nelson Mandela quoted her and it was often attributed to him. And I've, I have read this quote recently at church and I'm going to read it again. Our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we, is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is our light not our darkness that frightens us. We ask ourselves, who am I to be brilliant, gorgeous, talented, fabulous? Actually, who are you not to be? Your playing small does not serve the world. There is nothing enlightened about shrinking so that other people won't feel insecure around you. We are all meant to shine, as children do. It's not just in some of us, it's in everyone. And as we let our own light shine, we unconsciously give other people permission to do the same. As we are liberated from our own fear, our presence automatically liberates others. Letting our light shine is one of the most freeing acts that we can do in this life. And being in community, especially this community, can help you learn how to do this. You can be surprised. You might be surprised as, and if you try out your leadership wings. It's kind of where I tried out my first little flappy wings of leadership was in church. Perhaps you simply wish to be of service. There are many opportunities for you to do this. And as you learn and grow and gain confidence, you might wish to step out into the glaring light of day and confront injustice 
in the public square. Thank you, Audrey, for bringing that to our attention today. For we know that to be brave and courageous, we need others around us, sharing the load, getting dirty and bloody and sweaty with us. For we know that it is hard work to let your light shine, to be noticed, to stand close enough to injustice that we too are affected, and to push back when things just don't feel right. In a moment, we're going to sing the poem that was the chalice lighting. It is a, um, adapted by Lee Morris, written by Amanda Gorman, the young um, poet uh, laureate that spoke at Biden's inauguration. Um, and I have chosen it for our hymn of the month. Uh, the words are going to come up on the screen in a few mo moments. And Karen will play through the melody for us once, and then we'll sing it through three times. There are parts to this, but for, day, for today, we're going to learn the melody only. How many of you know this song? Oh, I was really, I'm, I am, um, I'm sorry Karen is not well, but I was, the choir was going to learn it on Thursday. So the choir will learn it next Thursday. And we're going to begin the work this week. And we're going to sing it today and for two more Sundays. And maybe a couple in, what's next? March, too. You never know. But you can stay seated for this. Uh, or you can, let's see. No. Let's rise in body or in spirit um, as, you, as you would like. And we'll sing, Be the Light. And Karen will lead, lead, play it through, and then we'll sing it. And John is going to leave my mic on so that I can help you sing through it as well. shine your light part. We are ready to see it. There is always a light. When we are ready to be it, to see the light, to be the light, to raise our eyes in the dark of night, to climb this hill, together we will. I'll teach the last part. That's shine your light in the darkness. Let's try that. Shine your light in the darkness. And we'll let's sing it once more. Shine your light in the darkness. Let your I don't know the notes. Well, let the your, let your bright light. Do you have the notes for that? Yeah. Let, okay, there we go. The bright light burn out loud and be a gift in the world. 
Shine your light in the darkness. Again, shine your light in the darkness. To your bright heart burn out the cloud and be a gift to the world. We'll leave it there, and we'll be hoping for choir, the choir to help us with it next week, because I needed the help. Thank you. But that was fun. Thank you for playing along. And we continue in a spirit of um, light, and thinking about ourselves as shining our light as we enter into a spirit of meditation. And I have chosen as um, uh, the poem that I'm going to share with you by Reverend Soto called Spinning the Light from their same book, Spilling the Light. So first of all, I'd like to invite you into a time of just of creating some space in your lungs and your body to let the air come in and nurture you. Our light needs air to glow, to be nurtured. The flame has to be fed. Just as we do, we have to be fed by food and water, by love, by caring, by self-worth. Let your body relax as you take some deep breaths. I'm going to read the poem, Spilling the Light, once. I'll give you a few moments of silence, and then I will read it again. Some people are used to keeping rules. Don't cross the street when the light is red. Only sensible. It turns out that keeping rules isn't the same as keeping covenant, which asks us, instead of keeping a bright line, to keep our promises. To what have we promised ourselves? To this moment in time and place. To this community, and even tenderly interconnected, this planet. We promise ourselves to the idea that we are each and all human beings. We promise that there is something moving between us that we cannot tame and we cannot measure. The chalice is a reminder that what flame we keep inside cannot light the way. The light must spill to shine. The thing you must be is yourself, unadulterated, shedding the will willingness to journey alone as though you are made of something hard and unforgivable. You are human. You belong right here, right now. And together we will chase away the sickness the secrets, and leave only the open possibility that the future is a space for growth. Spilling the light. Some people are used to keeping rules. Don't cross the street when the light is red. Only sensible. It turns out that keeping rules isn't the same as keeping covenant, which asks us, instead of keeping a bright line, to keep our promises. 
To what have we promised ourselves? To this moment in time and place. To this community and even tenderly interconnected this planet. We promise ourselves to the idea that we are each and all human beings. We promise that there is something moving between us that we cannot tame and cannot measure. The chalice is a reminder that what flame we keep inside us cannot light the way. The light must spill to shine. The first thing you must be is yourself unadulterated, shed, shedding the willingness to journey alone as though you are made of something hard and unforgivable. You are human. You belong right here, right now. We will chase away the sickness, the secrets, and leave only the open possibility that the future is a space for growth. And let's share a moment of silence after which I will introduce our candles of joy and concern. We light candles of joy and concern, gladness and grief to help one another and to help ourselves navigate this thing called life. We long to share our experiences. We long for others to know who we are and to love us just as we are. We long for acceptance. We long to show our light and have others bask in its warmth. I invite you to light a candle of joy and concern at this time. The tables are ready. And please line up on both sides. And I invite you now.
I'll ask Jeff to light last one last candle for all that we hold inside, all that is unspoken, and for those gathering this afternoon for a just cause. Thank you. Well, here's a hymn we know, and we know all the words, and we have all the music. So let us sing our closing hymn together, 1018, Come and Go With Me. I invite you to rise in body and or spirit and even sway with the music if you so dare. Thank you. I invite Yolene to extinguish the flame for us. As the chalice is extinguished, consider these words by John Murray and adapt by Reverend Rosemary. Go out into the highways and byways. Give the people something of your vision. You may possess a small light, but uncover it, let it shine. Use it to bring more light and understanding into the hearts and minds of everyone. Give them hope and courage, Speak only with kindness and love. Thank you, Eileen. And remember, after the service day, five minutes after the service, we'll be speaking about higher matters. There we go. Sorry, John. It's probably going. Arr. Yes, thank you. Thank you for mentioning that. I was going to mention that as well as I'd like to thank everyone that took, participated in this service and contributed to it. Um, it takes a lot of hands and a lot of brains and a lot of heart. And I'm grateful to each and every one of you that contributed to this service and to each of you that are here this morning in person and online and in the future in YouTube land. And I offer you these words of benediction. Do not be dismayed by the brokenness of the world. Things can break, and they can also be mended, but not with time, as they say, with intention. So I invite you to please go and love intentionally. Love extravagantly and love unconditionally. For the broken world waits in darkness for the light that is in you. Go in peace, gentle people. Go in peace. Amen. And let us join together and sing our linking song. If you're new here, we kind of make a circle. 
You can hold hands, but you don't have to. And we're going to sing, Carry the Flame. The words will appear or already have. 